Welcome to chapter 24 for AP Statistics. Today we're going to talk about comparing means. The natural display for comparing two groups is the box plot of the data for the two groups placed side by side. For example, here we have some duration times for batteries. We've got brand name and generic. Once we've examined the side by side box plots, we can turn to the comparison of two means. Comparing two means is not very different from comparing two proportions. This time the parameter of interest is the difference between the two means, mu1 minus mu2. Remember that for independent random quantities, variances add, not standard deviations. So the standard deviation of the difference between two sample means is, you can see right there, it's the square root of the sum of the individual variances. We still don't know the true standard deviations of the two groups, so we need to estimate and use the standard error. So there we've got the square root of the sum of the variances based on standard error. Because we are working with means and estimating the standard error of their difference using the data, we shouldn't be surprised that the sampling model is a student's t model. The confidence interval we build is called a two-sample t interval for the difference in means, the corresponding hypothesis test is called a two-sample t-test. When the conditions are met, the standardized sample differences between the means of two independent groups is t equals the difference in the sample means minus the difference in the, the means of the population divided by the standard error of the difference in the sample means. This can be judged by a student's T model with a number of degrees of freedom found with the special formula. We estimate the standard error with, and we, we saw this earlier, it's the square root of the sum of the variances estimated by the individual um, sample standard deviations. Assumptions and conditions, as always, these are important. So we want to be able to assume we have independent groups. Um, each condition needs to be checked for both groups. The first thing we need to do is make sure um, that we've the data were collected in a suitable randomized fashion, a representative random sample or a randomized experiment. Now we're checking independence within each group here, so we need to make sure that this is true for each one. Now the 10% condition, we don't really worry about this um, with differences in means. We check it for means only if we have a very, very small population or an extremely large sample. Normal population assumption, just like always, and this needs to be checked for both groups. You need, a, you need to check the nearly normal condition for each group, for both of them. Um, a violation by either one violates the condition. So you're going to be looking at two um, histograms or stem plots or dot plots, normal probability plots, something that lets you judge whether the nearly normal condition holds for each of the two groups. Now here's a new one, but it's very important. The independent groups assumption. The two groups we're comparing must be independent of each other. So really you want to think about whether they are plausibly independent. Is there anything linking the two or can we reasonably assume we have independent groups? Now in chapter 25, we're going to see what to do with groups that are not independent of each other. So we can still do um, a test and create an interval, but we have to use different methods. Okay. Two sample t interval. When the conditions are met, we are ready to find the confidence interval for the difference between means of two independent groups, mu1 minus mu2. And so the confidence interval is just like, like we've seen. It's the estimate plus or minus the um, critical value times the standard deviation or standard error of the estimate. So we have the difference in the sample means plus or minus t star with the number of degrees of freedom that we'll talk about in just a second times the standard error of the difference in the sample means. And it gives you the formula again for the standard error of the difference of the sample means. Again, it's the square root of the sum of the variances based on the sample standard deviations. The critical value um, T star with the specified degrees of freedom depends on the particular confidence level C that you specify and on the number of degrees of freedom which we get from the sample sizes in a special formula.
Right, the special formula for the degrees of freedom for our T critical value is a bear. You can see it right there. It's huge. I do not expect you to memorize that. Because of this, we will let technology calculate the degrees of freedom for us. It's, you're going to be able to use your calculator on all parts of the test, so we might as well um, go ahead and take advantage of it. All right. So that's interval. Let's talk about testing the difference between two means. The hypothesis test we will use is the two sample t-tests for means. The conditions for the two sample t-tests for the difference between the means of two independent groups are the same as for the two sample t-interval, and we already talked about those. We test the hypothesis h naught mu1 minus mu2 equals delta naught, where the hypothesized difference, delta naught, is almost always zero. Using the statistic t equals, the difference in the sample means minus that hypothesized difference divided by the standard error of the sample means. And again, we've got the same formula for standard error. When the conditions are met and the null hypothesis is true, this statistic can be closely modeled by student's t model with a number of degrees of freedom given by a special formula. And we use the model to obtain a p-value. Okay, the whole back into the pool thing, we will not pull when working with means. We just never will. We can't, we don't want to make the assumption about the variances being the same, so we won't be pulling. All right, so this is quick. What can go wrong? Watch out for paired data. The independent group's assumption deserves special attention. You really want to think about that because if the data are paired, we need to use the methods we're going to learn next time in Chapter 25. If the samples are not independent, you can't use two sample methods. Again, you're going to use the methods we learned in Chapter 25. Look at the plots. Check for outliers and non-normal distributions by making and examining box plots, histograms, stem plots, any of those two normal probability plots would be good too. All right, let's look at our examples. We're going to look at exercise 8, just parts A and B on page 580. Stereograms appear to be composed of entirely of random dots. However, they contain separate images that a viewer can fuse into 3D image um, by staring at the dots while defocusing the eyes. If you've seen the old episodes of Seinfeld, um, you'll remember Elaine had one in the office and it drove Mr. Pitt crazy because he couldn't see the 3D image. Um, and finally he did. Anyway, um, that's a stereogram. An experiment was performed to determine whether knowledge of the form of the embedded image affected the time required for the subjects to fuse the images. One group of subjects, group NV, received no information or just verbal information about the shape of the embedded object. They were told it's a pterodactyl. Okay. A second group, VV, received both verbal information and visual information, so if it was a pterodactyl, they, they received a drawing of the pterodactyl. The experimenters measured how many seconds it took for the subject to report that he or she saw the 3D image. So here it has um, some computer output for it. Two sample T interval for mu1 minus mu2. Confidence level 90%. Degrees of freedom equals 70. Mu NV minus mu VV interval 0 0.55 to 5.47. So we want to interpret your interval in context. We are 90% confident, based on this sample, that the people who received no or only verbal information about the image in the stereogram will take between 0 0.55 and 5.4 seconds, 47 seconds longer on average to report they saw the image than people who received both verbal and visual information. Does it appear that viewing the image help people see the 3D image in a stereogram? Yes, since the whole interval is positive. If there, there was no benefit to it, if there was a, a chance that, a reasonable chance, if it was plausible that the difference in the means were really zero, that there's no advantage to seeing the, the picture at all, then we would expect zero to be in our interval. But it's not. So it does seem that seeing the image ahead of time helps you see the 3D image in the stereogram, at least quickly. All right. 
In an investigate, now we're doing exercise 20, by the way, on page 582. In an investigation of environmental causes of disease, data were collected on the annual mortality rate, deaths per 100,000, for males in 61 large towns in England and Wales. In addition, the water hardness was recorded as the calcium concentration, parts per million, PPM, in the drinking water. The data set also notes for each town whether it was south or north of Derby. Is there a significant difference in mortality rates in the two regions? Here are the summary statistics. So it's a summary of mortality for categories in Derby, and we have two groups, north and south. There were 34 individuals in the north group, 27 individuals in the south group, and then we've got the mean of both groups, the median, and then the standard deviation for both groups. And again, that's the standard deviation of the sample. Test appropriate hypotheses and state your conclusion. It is plausible, we need to check our conditions, so it's plausible that the water supplies of the towns and the samples are representative of all water supplies north of Derby and south of Derby. The samples seem to be independent of each other. The sample sizes are large enough that if the distributions are unimodal and reasonably symmetric, the central limit theorem should apply. And that's because they're less than, they're bigger than 15, but less than 40. So they do, the distributions do need to be symmetric and, and or somewhat symmetric and unimodal. If the counts were greater than 40, then it wouldn't matter if they were skewed. But we'll proceed with caution and conduct a two sample t test. All right, our null hypothesis, we could write it as mu n minus mu s equals zero. I wrote it as mu n equals mu s, same difference, where mu n is the true mean calcium concentration for towns north of Derby, and mu s is true mean calcium concentration for towns south of Derby. Um, we're just, all we were interested in is if there is a significant difference. So that means we're going to do a two-sided test. We didn't have any reason to say that we expect one mean to be greater than the other. So we did not equal two. Um, you just go into your calculator, find the two sample T test and enter the data as it is requested. I would enter mu north as group one, mu south as group two, just because of the way I have it written. Um, I get a T of 6.47, degrees of freedom 53.49 from that awful formula that the calculator so kindly um, does for us. And then the p-value is 3.2 times 10 to the negative eight, which is essentially zero. So due to our small p-value approximately zero, we reject the null. Well, why do we do that? Remember, what this means is if the null were true, we would expect a difference at least as extreme as the one we observed in our data 0% of the time. Okay, so essentially we're saying it's not going to happen if the, if the null hypothesis is true or it would be extremely rare. There is sufficient evidence to support a difference in the Truman calcium concentration for towns north of Derby and towns south of Derby. Okay, guys, that's it. Um, come to class, ready to work some practice problems. I will see you soon. Have a good day.